Chapter 7 of Mim the Dwarf Now the tale turns to Mim the Petty Dwarf. The Petty Dwarves are long out of mind, for Mim was the last. Little was known from them, even in days of old. The Nibin Nogrim, the elves of Beleriand, called them long ago. But they did not love them. And the Petty Dwarves loved none but themselves. Well, if they hated and feared the orcs, they hated also the Eldar, and the exiles most of all, for the Noldor, they said, had stolen their lands and their homes. Nargothrond was first found, and its delving begun by the petty dwarves, long before Finrod Felagund came over the sea. They came, some said, of dwarves that had been banished from the dwarf cities of the east in ancient days. Long before the return of Morgoth, they had wandered westward. Being masterless and few in number, they found it hard to come by the ore of metals, and their smithcraft and store of weapons dwindled. They took to lives of stealth, and became somewhat smaller in stature than their eastern kin, walking with bent shoulders and quick furtive steps. Nonetheless, as all the dwarf kinds, they were far stronger than their stature promised, and they could cling to life in great hardship. But now, at last, they had dwindled and died out of Middle-earth, all saved Mim and his two sons. And Mim was old, even in the reckoning of dwarves, old and forgotten. After the departure of Beleg, and that was in the second summer after the flight of Turin from Doriath. Things went ill for the outlaws. There were rains out of season, and orcs in great numbers than before came down from the north and along the old south road over Tiglin, troubling all the woods on the west borders of Doriath. There was little safety or rest, and the company were more often hunted than hunters. One night as they lay, lurking in the fireless dark, Turin looked on his life, and it seemed to him that it might well be bettered. Well, I must find some secure refuge, he thought, and make provision against winter and hunger. But he did not know whither to turn. Next day he led his men away southward, further than they had yet come from the Tiglin, and the marches of Doriath. And after three days' journeying, they halted at the western edge of the woods of Syrian's Vale. And there the land was drier and barer as it began to climb up into the moorlands. Well, soon after it chanced that, as the grey light of day of rain was failing, Turin and his men were sheltering in a holly thicket, and beyond it was a treeless space in which there were many great stones leaning or tumbled together. All was still save for the drip of rain on the leaves. Suddenly a watchman gave a call, and leaping up they saw three hooded shapes, grey-clad, going stealthily among the stones. They were burdened each with a great sack, but they went swiftly for all that. Turin cried to them to halt, and the men ran on them like hounds. But they held on their way, and though Androg shot at them, two vanished in the dusk one lag behind being slower or more heavily burdened, and he was soon seized and thrown down, and held by many hard hands, though he struggled and bit like a beast. But Turin came up and rebuked his men. What have you there, he said? What need to be so fierce? It is old and small, what harm is in it? It bites, said Androg, nursing a bleeding hand. It's an orc, or of orc kin, kill it. What well, deserves no less for cheating our hope, said another, who had taken the sack. There is nothing here but roots and small stones. Nay, said Turin, it is bearded. It is only a dwarf, I guess. Let him up and speak. So it was that Mim came into the tale of the children of Hurin, for he stumbled up on his knees before Turin's feet and begged for his life. I am old, he said, and poor, only a dwarf, as you say, N not an orc. Mim is my name. Do not let them slay me, master, for no cause, as orcs would. And then Turin pitied him in his heart, but he said, 
Well, poor you seem, Mim, though. That would be strange in a dwarf. But we are poorer, I think, houseless and friendless men. If I said that we do not spare for pity's sake only, being in great need, what would you offer for ransom? Mm, I do not know what you desire, Lord, said Mim wearily. At this time little enough, said Turin, looking about him bitterly with rain in his eyes. A safe place to sleep in, out of the damp woods. Doubtless you have such for yourself. I have, said Mim, but I cannot give it in ransom. I am too old to live under the sky. You need grow no older, said Androg, stepping up with a knife in his unharmed hand. I can spare you that. Lord, cried Mim in a great fear, clinging to Turin's knees, if I lose my life, you lose your dwelling, for you will not find it without Mim. I cannot give it, but I will share it. There is more room in it than once there was. So many have gone forever, and he began to weep. Your life is spared, Mim, said Turin. Well, till he come to his lair, at least, said Androg. But Turin turned upon him and said, If Mim brings us to his home without trickery, and it is good, then his life is ransomed, and he shall not be slain by any man who follows me. So I swear. Then Mim kissed Turin's knees and said, Mim will be your friend, Lord. At first he thought you were an elf by your speech and your voice, but if you are a man, that is better. Mim does not love elves. And where is this house of yours, says Androg? It must be good indeed to share it with a dwarf, for Androg does not like dwarves. His people brought few good tales of that race out of the east. <laughs> they left worse tales of themselves behind them, said Mim. But judge my home when you see it. But you will need light on your way, you stumbling men. I will return in good time and lead you. And then he rose and picked up his sack. Oh, <laughs> no, no, said Androg. You will not allow this, surely, Captain. You will never see the old rascal again. Hmm. It is growing dark, said Turin. Let him leave us some pledge. Shall we keep your sack and its load, Mim? But at this the dwarf fell on his knees again in a great trouble. If Mim did not return, he would not come back for an old sack of roots, he said. I will come back. Let me go. I will not, said Turin. If you will not part with your sack, you must stay with it. A night under the leaves will make you pity us in your turn, maybe. But he marked, and others also, that Mim set more store by the sack and his load than it seemed worth to the eye. They led the old dwarf away to their dismal camp, and as he went he muttered in a strange tongue that seemed harsh with ancient hatred. But when they put bonds on his legs he went suddenly quiet, and those who were on the watch saw him sitting on through the night silent and still as a stone, save for the sleepless eyes that glinted as they roved in the dark. Before morning the rain ceased and a wind stirred the trees. Dawn came more brightly then, for many days, and light airs from the south opened the sky, pale and clear about the rising of the sun. Mim sat on without moving, and he seemed as if dead, for now the heavy lids of his eyes were closed, and the morning light showed him withered and shrunken with age. Turin stood and looked down on him. There is light enough now, he said. And then Mim opened his eyes and pointed to his bonds, and when he was released he spoke fiercely. Now learn this, fools, he said. Do not put bonds on a dwarf. He will not forgive it. I do not wish to die, but for what you have done my heart is hot. I repent my promise. Yeah, but I do not, said Turin. You will lead me to your home. Until then we will not speak of death. That is my will. He looked steadfastly in the eyes of the dwarf, and Mim could not endure it. Few indeed could challenge the eyes of Turin and set will or in wrath. Soon he turned away his head and rose. Follow me, Lord, he said. Good, said Turin, but now I will add this. I understand your pride. You may die, but you shall not be set in bonds again. I will not, said Mim, but come now. And with that he led them back to the place where he had been captured, and he pointed westward. There is my home, he said. You have seen it, often, I guess, for it is tall. Sharbhund, we called it, before the elves changed all the names, and then they saw that he was pointing to Amon Rud, 
the bald hill whose bare head watched over many leagues of the wild. We have seen it, but never near us, said Androg, for what safe lair can there be there, or water or any other thing that we need? I guessed that there was some trick. Do men hide on a hilltop? <laughs> Long sights may be safer than lurking, said Turin. Amon Rud gazes far and wide. Well, Mim, I will come and see what you have to show. How long will it take us stumbling men to come hither? Now all this day until dusk if we start now, answered Mim. Soon the company set out westward, and Turin went at the head with Mim at his side. They walked wearily when they left the woods, but all the land seemed empty and quiet. They passed over the tumbled stones and began to climb, for Amon Rud stood upon the eastern edge of the high moorlands that rose between the vales of Syrian and Narog. And even above the stony heath, at its base, its crown was reared up a thousand feet or more. Upon the eastern side, a broken land climbed slowly up to the high ridges among the knots of birch and rowan, and ancient thorn trees rooted in rock. Beyond, upon the moors and about the lower slopes of Amon Rud, there grew thickets of Aegalos, but its steep grey head was bare, save for the red ceragon that mantled the stone. As the afternoon was waning, the outlaws drew near to the roots of the hill. They came now from the north, for, as Mim had led them in the light of the westering sun, fell upon the crown of Amon Rud, and the ceragon was all in flower. See, there is blood on the hilltop, said Androg. Not yet, replied Turin. The sun was sinking and light was failing in the hollows. The hill now loomed up before them and above them, and they wondered what need there could be of a guide to so plain a mark. But as Mim led them on, and they began to climb the last steep slopes, they perceived that he was following some path by secret signs or old custom. Now his course wound to and fro, and if they looked aside they saw that at either hand dark dells and chines opened, or the land ran down into wastes of great stones with falls and holes masked by bramble and thorn. There, without a guide, they might have laboured and clambered for days to find a way. At length they came to steeper but smoother ground. They passed under the shadows of ancient rowan trees, into aisles of long-legged aegloss, a gloom filled with a sweet scent. Then suddenly there was a rock wall before them, flat-faced and sheer, forty feet high maybe, but dusk dimmed the sky above them and guess was uncertain. Is this the door of your house, said Turin. Dwarves love stone, it is said. He drew close to Mim, lest he should play them some trick at the last. Not the door of the house, but the gate of the garth, said Mim. Then he turned to the right along the cliff foot, and after twenty paces he halted suddenly. And Turin saw that by the work of hands or of weather, there was a cleft so shaped that two faces of the wall overlapped and an opening ran back to the left between them. Its entrance was shrouded by long trailing plants rooted in crevices above, but within there was a steep stony path going upward in the dark. Water trickled down it, and it was dank. One by one they filed up. At the top the path turned right and south again, and brought them through a thicket of thorns out upon a green flat through which it ran on into the shadows. They had come to Mim's house, Bar, En, Nibin, Noeg, which only ancient tales in Doriath and Nagothrond remembered, and no men had seen. But night was falling, and the east was starlit, and they could not yet see how this strange place was shaped. Amon Rud had a crown, a great mass like a steep cap of stone with a bare flattened top. Upon its north side there stood out from it a shelf, level and almost square, which could not be seen from below, for behind it stood the hill crown like a wall, and west and east from its brink sheer cliffs fell. Only from the north as they had come could it be reached with ease by those who knew the way. From the gate a path led, 
and passed soon from a little grove of dwarfed birches growing about a clear pool in a rock-hewn basin. This was fed by a spring at the foot of the wall behind, and through a runnel it spilled like a white thread over the western brink of the shelf. Behind the screen of the trees near the spring, between two tall buttresses of rock, there was a cave. No more than a shallow grot, it looked, with a low broken arch. But further in, it had been deepened and bored, far under the hill by the slow hands of the petty dwarves in the long years they had dwelt there, untroubled by the grey elves of the woods. Through the deep dusk, Mim led them, past the pool, where now the faint stars were mirrored among the shadows of the birch boughs. At the mouth of the cave he turned and bowed to Turin. Enter, Lord, he said, Bar and Danwer, the house of ransom, for so it shall be called. That may be, said Turin. I will look at it first. Then he went in with Mim, and the others, seeing him unafraid, followed behind, even Andrew, who most misdoubted the dwarf. They were soon in a black dark, but Mim clapped his hands, and a little light appeared coming round a corner. From a passage at the back of the outer grot, there stepped another dwarf bearing a small torch. Ha! I missed him, as I feared, said Androg. But Mim spoke quickly with the other in their own harsh tongue, and seemed troubled or angered by what he heard. He darted into the passage and disappeared. Now Androg was all for going forward. Attack first, he cried. There may be a hive of them, but they are small. Three only, I guess, said Turin, and he led the way while behind him the outlaws groped along the passage by the feel of the rough walls. Many times it bent this way and that at sharp angles, but at last a faint light gleamed ahead, and they came into a small but lofty hall, dim lit by lamps hanging down out of a roof shadow upon fine chains. Mim was not there. But his voice could be heard, and led by it, Turin came to the door of a chamber, opening at the back of the hall. Looking in, he saw Mim kneeling on the floor. Beside him stood silent the dwarf with the torch, but on a stone couch by the far wall lay another. Him! 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 the old dwarf wailed, tearing at his beard. Not all your shots went wild, said Turin to Andrug. But this may prove an ill hit. You loose shaft too lightly, but you may not live long enough to learn wisdom. Leaving the others, Turin entered softly and stood behind Mim and spoke to him. What is the trouble, master? he said. I have some healing arts. May I help you? Mim turned his head and his eyes had a red light. Not unless you can turn back time and cut off the cruel hands of your men, he answered. This is my son an arrow in his breast, now he is beyond speech. He died at sunset. Your bonds held me from healing him. Again, pity, long hardened, welled in Turin's heart as water from rock. Alas, he said, I would recall that shaft if I could. Now, bar and Danwith, House of Ransom shall this be called in truth, for whether we dwell here or no, I will hold myself in your debt. If ever I come to any wealth, I will pay you a Danworth of heavy gold for your son in token of sorrow, even if it gladdens your heart no more. Then Mim rose and looked long at Turin. I hear you, he said. You speak like a dwarf lord of old, and at that I marvel. Now my heart is cooled, though it is not glad. My own ransom I will pay, therefore. You may dwell here, if you will, but this I will add. He that loosed the shaft shall break his bow and his arrows and lay them at my son's feet, and he shall never take an arrow nor bear bow again, and if he does, he shall die by it. That curse I lay on him. Androg was afraid when he heard of this curse, and though he did so with great grudge, he broke his bow and his arrows and laid them at the dead dwarf's feet. But as he came out from the chamber, he glanced evilly at Mim and muttered, The curse of a dwarf never dies, they say, but a man's too may come home. May he die with a dart in his throat. 
That night they lay in the hall and slept uneasily for the wailing of Mim and of Ibun, his other son. When that ceased they could not tell, but when they woke at last the dwarves were gone and the chamber was closed by a stone. The day was fair again, and in the morning sunshine the outlaws washed in the pool and prepared such food as they had, and as they ate Mim stood before them. He bowed to Turin. He is gone and all is done, he said. He lies with his fathers. Now we turn to such life as is left, though the days before us may be short. Does Mim's home please you? Is the ransom paid and accepted? It is, said Turin. Then all is yours to order your dwelling. Here as you will, save this. The chamber that is closed, none shall open it but me. We hear you, said Turin. But as for our life here, we are secure, or so it seems. But still we must have food and other things. How shall we go out, or still more, how shall we return? To their disquiet, Mim laughed in his throat. <laughs> Do you fear that you have followed a spider to the heart of his web, he said? Nay, Mim does not eat men, and a spider could ill deal with thirty wasps at a time. See, you are armed, and I stand here bare. No, we must share. You and I, house, food, and fire, and maybe other winnings. The house I guess you will guard and keep secret for your own good, even when you know the ways in and out, and you will learn them in time. But in the meantime, Mim must guide you, or Ibun, his son, when you go out. The one will go where you go and return when you return, or await you at some point that you know and can find unguided. Ever nearer and nearer home will that be, I guess. To this Turin agreed, and he thanked Mim, and most of his men were glad. For under the sun of morning, while summer was yet high, it seemed a fair place to dwell in. Androg alone was ill-content. Well, the sooner we are masters of our own comings and goings, the better, he said. Never before have we taken a prisoner with a grievance to and fro on our ventures. That day they rested, cleaned their arms, mended their gear, for they had food to last a day or two yet, and Mim added to what they had. Three great cooking pots he lent to them, and firing, and he brought out a sack. Rubbish, he said, not worth the stealing, only wild roots. But when they were washed, the roots proved white and fleshy with their skins, and when boiled they were good to eat, somewhat like bread, and when the outlaws were glad of them. For they had long lacked bread, save when they could steal it, Wild elves know them not, no <laughs> grey elves have not found them, and proud ones from over the sea are too proud to delve, said Mim. What is their name? said Turin. Mim looked at him sidelong. They have no name, save in the dwarf tongue, which we do not teach, he said. And we do not teach men to find them, for men are greedy and thriftless, and would not spare till all the plants had perished, whereas now they pass them by as they go blundering in the wild. No more will you learn of me. But you may have enough of my bounty, as long as you speak fair and do not spy or steal. And then again he laughed in his throat. <laughs> they are of great worth, he said, more than gold in the hungry winter, for they may be hoarded like the nuts of a squirrel. And already we were building our store from the first that are ripe. But you are fools if you think that I would not be parted from one small load, even for the saving of my life. I hear you, said Ulrad who had looked in the sack when Mim was taken. Yet you would not be parted, and your words only make me wonder the more. Mim turned and looked at him darkly. You are one of the fools that spring would not mourn if you perished in winter, he said to him. I had spoken my word, and so must have returned, willing or not, with sack or without. Let a lawless and a faithless man think what he will. But I love not to be parted from my own by force of the wicked, be it no more than a shoe thong. Do I not remember that your hands were among those that put bonds upon me, and so held me that I did not speak again with my son? Ever when I deal out the earth bread from my store, you will be counted out, and if you eat it, you shall eat by the bounty of your fellows, not of me. And then Mim turned away. But Ulrad, who had quailed under his anger, spoke to his back. High words! Nonetheless, the old rogue had other things in his sack of like shape, but harder and heavier. 
Maybe there are other things beside earth bred in the wild which elves have not found and men must not know. Well that may be, said Turin. Nonetheless the dwarf spoke the truth in one point at least, calling you a fool. Why must you speak your thoughts? Silence, if fair words stick in your throat, would serve all our ends better. The day passed in peace, and none of the outlaws desired to go abroad. Turin paced much upon the green sward of the shelf from brink to brink, and he looked out east and west and north, and wandered and wondered to find how far were the views and the clear air. Northward, and seeming strangely near, he could descry the forest of Brethel, climbing green about the Ammon Obel. Thither he found that his eyes would stray more often than he wished, though he knew not why for his heart was set rather to the north-west, where league upon league away on the skirts of the sky, it seemed to him that he could glimpse the mountains of shadow and the borders of his home. But at evening, Turin looked west into the sunset, as the sun rode down reared into the hazes above the far distant coasts, and the veil of Narog lay deep in the shadows between. So began the abiding of Turin, son of Hurin, in the halls of Mim, in Bar in Danwith, the house of ransom. For a long while the lives of the outlaws went well to their liking. Food was not scarce, and they had good shelter, warm and dry, with room enough and to spare, for they found the caves could have housed a hundred or more at need. There was another, smaller hall further in. It had a hearth at one side, above which a smoke shaft ran up through a rock to a vent cunningly hidden in a crevice on the hillside. There were also many other chambers, opening out of the halls or the passage between them, some for dwelling, some for works or for stores. In storage, Mim had more arts than they, and he had many vessels and chests of stone and wood that looked to be of great age. But most of the chambers were now empty. In the armories hung axes and other gear rusted and dusty. Shelves and ombres were bare, and the smithies were idle, save one. A small room which led out of the inner hall and had the hearth which shared the smoke vent of the hearth in the hall. There Mim would work at times, but would not allow others to be with him. And he did not tell of a secret hidden stair that led from his house to the flat summit of Amon Rud. This Androg came upon when, seeking in hunger to find Mim's stores of food, he became lost in the caves but he kept this discovery to himself. During the rest of that year they went on no more raids, and if they stirred abroad for hunting or gathering of food, they went out for the most part in small parties. But for a long while they found it hard to retrace their road, and besides Turin, not more than six of his men became ever sure of the way. Nonetheless, seeing that those skilled in such things would come to their lair without Mim's help, they set a watch by day and night near to the cleft in the north wall. From the south they expected no enemies, nor was there fear of any climbing Amon Rud from that quarter. But by day there was at most times a watchman set to the top of the crown who would look for all about. Steep as were the sides of the crown, the summit could be reached, for to the east of the cave mouth rough steps had been hewn leading up the slopes where men could clamber unaided. So the year wore on without hurt or alarm, but as the days drew in and the pool became grey and cold and the birches bare, and great rains returned, they had to pass more time in shelter. Then they soon grew weary of the dark underhill, or the dim half-light of the halls, and to most it seemed that life would be better if it were not shared with Mim. Too often he would appear out of some shadowy corner or doorway when they thought him elsewhere, and when Mim was near, unease fell on their talk, and they took to speaking ever to one another in whispers. Yet, and strange it seemed to them, with Turin it went otherwise, and he became ever more friendly with the old dwarf, and listened more and more to his counsels. In the winter that followed, he would sit for long hours with Mim, listening to his lore and the tales of his life. Nor did Turin rebuke him if he spoke ill of the Eldar. Mim seemed well pleased and showed much favour to Turin in return, 
Him only would he admit to his smithy at times, and there they would talk softly together. But when autumn had passed, the winter pressed them hard. Before Yule snow came down from the north, heavier than they had known it in the river vales. At that time, and ever the more as the power of Angband grew, the winters wor worsened in Beleriand. Amon Ruth was covered deep, and only the hardiest dared stir abroad. Some fell sick, and all were pinched with hunger. In the dim dusk of a day in midwinter, there appeared suddenly among them a man, as it seemed, of great bulk and girth, cloaked and hooded in white. He had eluded their watchman, and he walked up to their fire without a word. When men sprang up, he laughed and threw back his hood, and they saw that it was Beleg Strongbow. Under his wide cloak he bore a great pack in which he had brought many things for the help of men. In this way Beleg came back to Turin, yielding to his love against his wisdom. Turin was glad indeed, for he had often regretted his stubbornness, and now the desire of his heart was granted without the need to humble himself or to yield his own will. But if Turin was glad, not so was Androg, nor some others of his company. It seemed to them that there had been a tryst between Beleg and their captain, which he had kept secret from them, and Androg watched them jealously as the two sat apart in speech together. Beleg had brought with him the helm of Hador, for he hoped that it might lift Turin's thought again above his life in the wild as the leader of a petty company. This is your own which I bring back to you, he said to Turin as he took out the helm. It was left in my keeping on the north marches, but it was not forgotten, I think. Almost, said Turin, but it shall not be so again. And he fell silent, looking far away with the eyes of his thought, until suddenly he caught the gleam of another thing that Beleg held in his hand. It was the gift of Melian. But the silver leaves were red in the firelight, and when Turin saw the seal, his eyes darkened. What have you there? he said. The greatest gift that one who loves you still has to give, answered Beleg. Here is Lembas in Eleth, the waybread of the Eldar that no man has yet tasted. Well, the helm of my fathers I take with good will for your keeping, said Turin, but I will not receive gifts out of Doriath. Then send back your sword and your arms, said Beleg. Send back also the teaching and fostering of your youth, and let your men who, you say, have been faithful, die in the desert to please your mood. <laughs> Nonetheless, this waybread was a gift, not to you, but to me, and I may do with it as I will. Eat it not if it sticks in your throat, but others may be more hungry and less proud. Turin's eyes glinted. But as he looked in Beleg's face, the fire in them died, and they went grey. And he said in a voice hardly to be heard, I wonder, friend, that you deign to come back to such a churl. From you I will take whatever you give, even rebuke. Henceforward you shall counsel me in all ways, save the road to Doriath only.'